Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being so much more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 156, and we're going to talk about something I haven't talked about yet in depth, which is kind of weird, and it's the wool trade. So as you're putting on your woolen sweaters, or if you have a fun Christmas sweater, we're going to go back and talk about this trade in cloth and textiles and raw materials that basically kept England going for over 300 years or so. So we're going to chat about that in a minute. But first, admin and announcements. The holidays are coming up. I've got some amazing holiday gift ideas. So to start with, Black Friday has come to my audio course, Kick-Ass Tutor Women. It's now 50% off on Himalaya Learning. Himalaya is an audio learning platform that provides an extensive library of courses from the world's greatest minds like Malcolm Gladwell, Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin, and more. (laughs) Can I just tell you guys how crazy it is to like read those names out and know that my course is also up there with them? Like. That's just insane. I'm just it it just kind of makes my <laughs> it kind of makes my cheeks hurt. It makes me smile so much. Anyway, so you can take advantage of this discount and learn something amazingly new this year. Go to Himalaya.com slash Heather. Himalaya.com slash Heather to get your 50% off discount. Now, second, tutor con tickets for 2021 because you know, seriously, we all need to start planning some fun stuff after 2020, right? And they're going to be discounted for Black Friday starting on Friday because I'm old school like that. So check it out at englandcast.com slash tutorcon 2021. Three days of tutor talks, music, bonding with your new best tutor friends and fun in beautiful Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, October 1st through 3rd. englandcast.com slash tutorcon 2021. I have just about 35 tickets left, so they will very likely sell out. And you don't want to miss out on this amazing event. And also one other thing, if you need a payment plan, I can work with you on that. I don't want to make it, I know 2020, like everything's weird. This whole world is just crazy right now. If you would like to come to TutorCon in 2021 and you need to sort out a payment plan, I'm totally happy to work with you on that. Just email me and let me know. Okay. And then speaking of missing out, I'm really sorry to say that the tutor planner is completely sold out, like gone, done. I contacted the printer about getting another batch made, but they wouldn't arrive until February, even if I placed the order today. And there's a really big minimum that they require to do it so quickly. So I can't do that. So I'm very, very sorry if you missed out on that. Next year, I'm going to order a bigger batch. And you can stay tuned for the Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign, which will happen in June to ensure that you get your copy. So no more tutor planners. They're done. Okay, but there is also lots of other cool stuff at tutorfair.com. Like, it's not just the planners. Moving on. This episode, like I said, is going to be about something that I'm surprised I never talked about in greater detail before. It's weird. We've skirted around it a lot of different times, talking about the economy and particularly land enclosures that reached a peak during the reign of Edward VI. We also talked about it in sumptuary laws when woolen caps were required of people. Um, But it's not something I ever devoted a complete episode to. And that is wool. Wool was England's number one export from the medieval period. It was a huge part of life for everyone in Tudor England. Very, very few people were not impacted by the wool trade. Interestingly, the wool trade began out of the Black Death, when the population had fallen so much by at least a third, the wealthy landowners had to find other ways to make money from their land, and sheep farming became the answer. The English climate was perfect for sheep, and it took far fewer people to tend to sheep versus plowing and planting a field. So the timing was really good as well. There was a hunger for raw wool in the Low Countries. And pretty soon, the English landowners were able to sell all the wool they made. The scale of their success is seen in the growth of wool towns, where wool churches towered over the landscape. Wool churches 
are the name for a church that was specifically made with wool profits, usually donated by a merchant who had benefited from the trade, and he would give part of his money to build this church in order to help secure his place in heaven. Wool churches are common in the Cotswolds and in East Anglia, where the huge profits led to the construction of these grand churches, which often replaced smaller churches, smaller places of worship, in order to show just how prosperous the community had become. The practice of building wool churches ended during the Reformation in England. So if you live in England and you want to do a bit of sightseeing when lockdowns end, there are some wonderful examples of wool churches at Holy Trinity Church of Long Melford, which was built in the 15th century with money from the local cloth merchants. And we see it in a huge scale in Norfolk at St. Mary's Church at Worsted in Norfolk. Worsted is the village that gave its name to the particular kind of cloth. I'm sure you've heard of worsted wool or um, worsted cloth. And the village church was built by local weavers in the 14th century, and it just towers over the community. And there were other East Anglian communities where we see wool churches as well, from this wealth from the wool just kind of pouring in. Wyndham, which played a major role in the C.J. Sampson book that came out called Tombland that featured Cat's Rebellion. So there's a wool church there, East Harling, Attleboro, Aylsham. The churches. They reflected the glory of the wool trade. Even in Norwich, which has more medieval churches than anywhere in Europe, it was the wool money that built all of these churches. Norfolk wool was suited to heavier cloth in particular, and so Norwich and Norfolk gained a complete monopoly on worsted. And it just led to this extraordinary building boom of churches. So you can see evidence of that even today in the skyline of Norwich with all of these ancient churches. And that came from wool money. So I will have links to these buildings, these sources for the whole episode at the show notes for this episode, which will be englandcast.com slash wool, englandcast.com slash wool. So as the wool trade grew and these towns became so successful, the crown got their share of the profits and wool taxes formed the majority of income for the crown. And in 1454, Parliament even decreed, this is in the midst of the Wars of the Roses and everything like that, Parliament decrees, the making of cloth within all parts of the realm is the greatest occupation and living of the poor commons of this land. So the crown saw wool is really important. The crown needed middlemen to handle the taxation of the wool. And so in came the Company of Merchants of the Staple of England, the Merchants of the Staple, also known as the Merchant Staplers. This is an English company incorporated by royal charter in 1319. It's the oldest mercantile corporation in England. It dealt in wool, skins, lead, and tin, and it controlled the export of wool to the continent, to Europe, during the late medieval period. Starting in 1314, the monarch required all wool for export to be traded at a designated market, and this market was called the staple. And this gave the crown the opportunity to monitor all of the trade and to tax everything. In 1347, Calais was conquered by the English and Calais became the staple starting in 1363. There had been some other towns that had been the staple before Bruges and Antwerp in the first half of the 14th century. But then it moved to Calais and a group of 26 traders incorporated as the company of the staple at Calais. In exchange for paying the taxes, the company was granted a total monopoly on wool exports from England. And the company became important to the English crown, both as a source of revenue from the tax payments and also in Calais defending against the French. Over the next hundred years or so, cloth production in England had increased. So we're moving from exporting just the plain raw material of the wool to actually making the cloth in England as well. And so the raw wool exports became less important and the merchants became less important as well. And in 1558, when Calais was lost to the French, the staple moved to Bruges and the merchant staplers continued their monopoly on exports. There was another middleman, a profession called a brugger, 
who handled the large quantities of wool for the merchants and organized it. They would have organized the wool into classifications of good or middle quality wool. Inferior wool was wool that came from sheep who were already found dead, for example, or what was left after the main fleece had gone, like from the legs. It was still worth trading, though. It could be used to make a rougher cloth. Weights were used during the packing of the wool. An average load was 28 pounds. And merchants, wool merchants, used the same kind of methods for weighing the wool even into the 20th century as they did during the medieval period. They balanced out 14 pound stones on a scale with the sacks of wool on the other side. And the wool man would deliver it all. The merchants would mark their wool, showing the name of the merchant and the quantity and the quality of the wool, and also some kind of a a marking number so that you could track the load. Large, large sums of money were involved in all of this, and often the balance was paid off in three installments. You would get one at the weighing of the wool, and then two more payments in between four months, three to four months. The wool left in convoys by the sea where they were less likely to be hit by pirates. And it also let merchants spread their cargo across the ship. So you didn't have all of your wool just in one ship in case that ship sunk. So you would spread it around. And sailings across the channel would happen in spring, summer, and autumn, but not in winter. The wool trade had the power to make or break an entire town. For example, Southampton. A considerable boost was given to the wool trade in Southampton in 1320 when Edward II decreed that the town would be one of only eight ports from which the export of wool would be allowed. This would provide a huge business for the town and create a lot of jobs, not just for the woolmen themselves, but also for the people serving on the boats. And also the people at pubs and inns and all of the different jobs associated with people who would be staying in Southampton. It meant so much to them that they actually built a wool house, which still exists, though these days it's an artisanal brewery. I mean, what isn't an artisanal brewery these days? But anyway, the wool house is one. (laughs) It's the only medieval building in Europe that was built solely for storing wood prior to shipment. It was built after a French raid in 1338, two stories built of stone. During the 14th and 15th century, it was used just for storing wool, as I said, but the changing economics as people began to navigate the Thames more easily and sail directly to the low countries from London meant that the wool house had to begin to diversify. And in the 16th century, the wool house was now referred to as the alum siler and was used as a storage for alum which was a double sulfate salt used for dyeing cloth. So it was still linked to cloth, but not just storing wool. The wool trade through Southampton was high until the mid-16th century when, as I said, people began to sail directly from London. And then the fortunes of the entire town of Southampton began to change, and they needed to figure out new ways to diversify as well. Another real-life example of the prosperity the wool brought about is the Hayden family in Norfolk. John Hayden I died in 1480, but he had become wealthy as a lawyer And he was the chief agent in East Anglia of William de la Pole, who was the Duke of Suffolk. So John began building Baconsthorpe Castle in the 1450s. But its rise would skyrocket during the 16th century under the Tudors, thanks to the wool trade. The following comes from the English Heritage website on Baconsthorpe Castle, which you can still visit today. They say by the mid 16th century, Baconsthorpe was at the heart of a huge estate. Christopher Hayden I, who was born around 1518, once had 30 head shepherds of his own flocks at Christmas dinner, and that suggests that there were at least 20 to 30,000 sheep on his lands. John Hayden II, who was born around 1470, transformed the east range of the castle into a factory for processing the wool from all of these flocks. They added large windows to provide light for the spinners and the weavers to work. And the fine cloth produced at Baconsthorpe was sold throughout England and the Netherlands. The ability to produce raw wool and then process it into textiles on site directly made the Haydens even more rich and powerful. In the 1560s, 
Christopher the first, Sir Christopher the first had 80 servants and he ran his own coach with two horses. But they began to spend more than they earned. Um, Sir Christopher built a huge outer gatehouse, made a large park, and one of his successors added ornamental gardens and a lake. And there were signs during Elizabeth's reign that they were living a bit beyond their means. There was a decline in the wool and cloth trade at this time. But when Christopher I died in 1579, he died in debt. He and his successors were not very good in business like, the, like their ancestors, but they still kept living as if they were, and they had huge parties. Sir William Hayden II tried to balance the books by selling land, but he also died in debt in 1593. Then there was Sir Christopher II. He wanted to spend his time writing about astrology and not dealing with sheep farming. And finally, John Hayden III, He fought on the wrong side in the Civil War, and he gave up and just sold all of the Hayden's Norfolk estates. And in about 1650, he dismantled the castle to sell as building materials. So over the course of 200 years, you have this family that rises to huge, immense wealth through the wool trade and then falls into decline as the wool trade starts to drop off as well. When we talk about the wool trade, how many sheep are we talking about? The average person would hold about 20 to 30 sheep, but the large landowners, like we just heard, had thousands. This, of course, led them to eventually enclosing the common lands in order to graze more sheep, which would mean more money for them. And that led to rebellions like the very famous Ketz Rebellion during the reign of Edward VI that I just talked about. And I'm going to say it again. If you, if you haven't read C.J. Sampson books, you need to because they're amazing. And his most recent book, Tombland, features Ket's Rebellion as pretty much the main story. So you should read that too if you want to know more about how these land enclosures impacted people in real life and impacted common people when they lost the rights to their common lands to graze their own animals, what that did to people and how they began to rebel. By the 16th century, the government tried to put caps and limits on how many sheep a landowner could own. In 1533, they set the maximum at 2,400, and you couldn't just own sheep. For every 60 animals, you had to have at least one milking cow. This was a statute of 1555, and also a calf for every 120 sheep. So the government wanted to keep people from only grazing sheep to the exclusion of everything else. Records show that during the period between 1540 and 1547, the annual raw wool export averaged 5,025 sacks, the equivalent of 28,790 sacks of finished cloth. And about half of the amount of cloth was actually kept in England for the domestic market. So if you double what was exported, you have an idea of what the total production of wool in England was. So you get 50,723 sacks estimated as the annual production of wool for England and Wales during that seven-year period. This has been calculated as meaning that you had to own 10,700,000 sheep, including lambs. So that's a lot of sheep. That's a lot of sheep in England. The wool trade led to one of the worst jobs in medieval Europe, which is saying something, and that would be the fuller. The fuller was an important part in the production of wool because wool needed to be treated with urine. So the wool was placed in a barrel of stale urine, and the fuller spent all day trampling on the wool to produce a softer cloth. Not a good time. Anyway, we talked about wool churches. There were also wool towns. Lavenham in Suffolk is acknowledged as the best example of a medieval wool town in England. During the Tudor period, Lavenham was said to be the 14th wealthiest town in England, despite its very small population. It still has very fine timber framed buildings and a beautiful church that were all built just on the success of the wool trade. In the 1570s to 90s, the clothing sumptuary laws required Englishmen, except nobles, to wear a woolen cap to church on Sundays 
And this was part of a government plan to help support the wool industry. This is when we start to see the decline of the wool industry and the government thinks they can prop it up by requiring that everybody has to wear a woolen cap on Sundays. And the wool trade began to shift during the Tudor period, as we've seen. It also moved into the sale of finished cloth instead of just plain wool exports. By the 1520s, just plain wool exports was declining sharply, and the exports of wool and cloth was growing. To start with, this was due to the popularity of the very thick broadcloth in Northern Europe. And then later, throughout the 16th century, there was a new kind of cloth developed, kersey, which was lighter but coarser. And the coarseness came because it took less fulling and there was less felting, and this became very popular in Southern Europe. It's a thinner kind of cloth. Initially, both of these kinds of cloth were shipped undyed and undressed to Antwerp. But by the mid-16th century, the English began to finish and dye their cloth at home and send that to Europe, which led to a greater profit. By the middle of the 16th century, the middlemen we talked about started to separate off into three separate classes. There was the staple at the top. They dealt in large quantities with the export market. They were wealthy, owned large country houses in the areas where wool was produced. And then they had a middleman who traveled the area collecting the bundles of wool. And then finally came the commodity dealers, like glove makers, who bought raw materials for their own products. They bought sheepskin and removed the fleece before processing the skin, and then they would sell the wool to dealers and other manufacturers. After the middle of the 16th century, though, this large-scale woolen trade with Northern and Central Europe began to slow down, and partly this was due to the stress in the relationship between England and much of the rest of Europe after England broke away from the church and there was all the religious struggle. But Germany also began to develop their own woolen industry which they protected with very heavy taxes and tariffs. Also, taste in clothing was starting to change by the end of the 16th century, and people wanted lighter and thinner clothing. But England still stayed in the cloth export business. In the late 16th century, we see Huguenot weavers coming from France, and they brought a lot of skills with them. They were very skilled in weaving a finished cloth, And England began to bypass Flanders in woolen manufacture. And by the end of the 17th century, the export of finished cloth made up two thirds of English exports. So it went from being the wool itself to the finished cloth. But as you can see from all the different people employed, you can start to think about how far out the economy of wool reached and how many people were affected by the economy of wool Very, very few people in England weren't in some way impacted by what was going on in the wool trade. So that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about wool. You can get show notes at englandcast.com slash wool. And also you can get in touch with me. Listen up if you want a TudorCon payment plan, because it's how you can get in touch with me. First, you can text me at 801-6-TESCO. That's 801-683-9756. Or you can join the Tudor Learning Circle. I'm basically off Facebook these days. Um, I'm just, just not on it. I'm also off Twitter. It's made my life so much more simple. I highly recommend it. But I am hanging out at the Tudor Learning Circle. So that's tutorlearningcircle.com. You can get in touch with me there. Or you can always just email me. So that's that. And also, if you want some information on getting a payment plan together for TutorCon, I'm happy to work with you on that. Completely, completely happy to do that. Also, don't forget about Himalaya and the audio courses, my Tutor Women course, and hundreds of others on the Himalaya platform, 50% off for Black Friday. You can go to Himalaya.com slash Heather to get all of the discount information for that. All right. Thank you so much for listening, you guys. I'll be back next week with a supplemental episode, um, a chat that James Bolton and I did in the Tudor Learning Circle a week or so ago um, on the Tudor Queens. So that'll be fun. And then I'll be back in another two weeks with a regular episode as well. And so I hope that you are having a happy holiday weekend. And I say that knowing that it's weird. And for a lot of you, it's actually really not happy. Um, I hope that we can all 
find things that we're grateful for in life. I'm grateful for you listening to my show, of course, and always being so supportive. Blow northern wind, a scent will make me sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoot a board in Bauerbrick, that soul is Sam Lee's on seat. Men school maiden of me, fair and freight of fond. In all this world, me shall won a board of blood and a bond. Never yet in Ustenon.